start recording and it should be recording right now. All right. So to get the WebEx uh, session open, we're going to have to go up to the network where we found our syllabus and the band invite link and all of that stuff. So in case you've forgotten how to do that, um, the easiest way, probably down here in your little search bar down in this very bottom corner where you can type to search in the name of a software. Sorry, it's kind of cutting it off on the screen up here. Type backslash backslash ETSUE3. Okay. Um, and then hit enter. And that's going to open up one of the um, file explorers. Now again, faculty is where most of my stuff is. And then Greg. And I've put this file here in just the Greg folder because I use this across all of my classes, the same WebEx link. This little link right here, um, drag that into a browser. Now my understanding, I, I'm usually on this end of a WebEx uh, session, but my understanding from the students is this works best in Chrome. Um, although Chrome eats up a lot of resources, if you want to open up a Chrome tab, you can just drag that WebEx file into Chrome and it'll automatically take you to that link. If you double click it, it'll open it up in Explorer or Edge or whatever it's called now. Um, and it, it may work fine, I don't know. Um, if you're, you're welcome to try it. What it's going to do is it's going to install a quick little uh, plug-in to whatever browser you put it on, and then it's going to take you into this sign-in page where you can use your real name, you can use a fake name, you can use whatever you want to, but it's basically allowing you to sign into a webinar. Um, interestingly, this is something that um, if for some reason we ever needed to, I could set this up and have a live like one-on-one -on -one session with you. Let's say you something happens, you have to go out of town for an emergency, but you need to ask me some questions. We could open this up and I could do a, a little one-on-one -on -one meeting with you. So, yes? Oh, one question. How do you open Chrome? Um, if you just open any type of, if you just double click on Chrome and open it up, and then you drag the WebEx link that's right here. Okay. If you just drag and drop that on Chrome, okay. it, it's very similar to like opening it in Chrome. So it'll, it'll just take you. All that little thing there is is just the web address embedded. So you can just drag and drop it and show people. Um, can we add the additional? Yeah, yeah. If, it, if it's asking you to install, like it's a, install extension or a plugin or something like that, go ahead and install that. You'll probably have to do that every time you log in. Um, because really what's happening is when you log off of this computer and then log back in, um, it's like you installed a brand new version of Windows and opened it for the first time. Right? Every, pro every program that you open, all of that stuff, is going to act like you just installed it and this is your first time running it. And that includes, annoyingly enough, stuff like Windows Media Player. Um, so that's some of the things you have to get used to. So it'll probably wipe that plug in, and if we do this next class period, you'll have to reinstall it again. But it usually just takes a second or two. So, anybody having any issues getting Linux to work? If you do, so this I, I'm not one of those teachers that's like, be quiet. I'm here to talk and listen. And you're here to watch me. Like, no. Whenever you have any issues at all about anything, stop me. Um, sometimes it's like, I'm going to repeat that, don't worry, and I'll just go over it with the whole class again. But the question you have may be a question that five other people has as well, have as well, um, and they're just too embarrassed to raise their hand. So please ask questions. Don't ever, like, uh, don't worry about interrupting me. Just sort of raise your hand, flag me down. Um, and that includes if you start feeling like you're getting left behind as we're walking through some stuff. Um, I've, I've had this issue before where I'm like, okay, we're all gonna walk through this section of the project together, and we start working on it, and like an hour later, I'm like, okay, has everybody got that? And I walk around the room and nobody has it. And at that point, like, I have to catch the entire class up. I would rather like catch you up really quick at the beginning and you're able to keep, a, keep up um, than having to try to reteach that whole class again to get you back up to that same section. So, if, just slow me down, stop me, ask questions. That's why I'm here. This is, most of these classes are going to be very casual. If you have a general question, like, hey, why are we doing that? Like, or what's that for? What's that button mean? Any of that stuff, like, slow me down. That's, that's how this works. And I have a tendency sometimes to get carried away when I'm lecturing. I go a little fast, or sometimes I slow down. So, um, 
If I'm going too slow, feel free to tell me that too. Marlo, stop babbling. Come on, we got that. All right. So if you've got WebEx open, you are probably seeing what's on my screen right here on your other monitor or whatever window you have Chrome open on. What most people usually do is they'll put that on their small monitor and they'll use their bigger monitor to, to work. Um, however you want to do it, it's your desktop. Um, but that works pretty well and it allows you to just sort of glance over and see what I'm doing. Okay, anybody have any issues with that? So, how many of you have tried to open Maya? Okay. Is it working for you? No. Mine says that you need to put a code on. Okay. Yeah, I need the license. Yeah, the license. All right. I was worried about that. Let's try it. Have you tried it today? Yes. Or was that just? Okay, so it's doing that again today. Let's, let's see what it does on mine. So, generally, what you would do is you would go here and you would type Maya. You get Autodesk Maya 2018, and it's probably going to give it, yeah, okay. That's okay. Let's see. Specify the last for servants, service system. Let's see if this will let us do it. So if I go next and type backslash backslash ETSU E3 and hit next, what does it do? Okay, that's fine. So this is... Um, this is an issue. I thought this was resolved, but apparently it isn't in all labs. So we kind of have a workaround for this, because um, otherwise I'd have to be like, all right, class is over, bye. Um, I haven't tried this yet, so we're doing this together. Um, so what's happening is it's looking for the license for Maya. It's not finding it in the right place, and there's some settings we can change in Maya that would fix that, um, and it's a little bit of a painful workaround. But Marty Fitzgerald, who's actually the chair of the department, um, has set up a, a batch file that should fix this for us. Hopefully this is a, an issue that we'll resolve over the next few days, and we can just double-click on Maya, and it'll, it'll work fine. So let's try this, though, and see if this works. So in that same folder where we found the WebX, there's this pleaseworkmaya.bat. Double-click on that. Okay. So I think what's happening is there's a license file on this computer that's looking for um, the Maya license in a different location. Yes? Uh, it's just giving me a prompt to either create a default license or something like that. Okay, yeah, so if you're getting that, um, hopefully you can double click on it. All right, so that's what I feel like we're, yeah, we're kind of a mixed bag of stuff. So, Yours is getting create default preferences. Anybody else getting that? Yeah. Okay. So let me tell you what that means, and then you can you can make a decision on what you want to do or not. So if you've used, I'm assuming the people who are getting that, you've used Maya before, right? You've been able to open Maya in previous semesters? Yes. Or no. Okay. So what all that's asking is um, in your in your project folder or in your um in your documents folder, Maya saves um, this like preference file, and it's asking, do you want to create that file or not? Um, I would go ahead and say create default preferences, um, but recognize that by doing that, if you have like some scripts that you use a lot in previous versions of this class or something, it may overwrite like your like your buttons on your shelf or something like that. But more than likely, it'll it'll do nothing. So that should be fine like that. Okay. Anybody not get Maya to open when they did that? Issues? All right. So this is what we get. And again, Maya thinks this is, this is the first time we've ever opened this program. And this time it's right. Um, next time it's still going to ask you this as if you've never opened Maya before. Um, I, I, you can go ahead and hit okay. Um, and what you should get is this. And sometimes you'll get another little window that'll pop up here in a second. Let's see. If it does. Well, maybe not. Sometimes you get a window that pops up and asks you if you want to um, enable some of the, there it is, uh, the new features highlighting system. So all this is asking is, if you look around the, the interface, some things kind of have this green 
bracket around it, all that's doing is telling you what is new to Maya 2018. So these are things that wasn't, that were not in Maya 2017, right? Um, it's up to you on this because it's all probably kind of new to you. Um, I usually leave it on just to remind me where the new features are and I can try them out. Um, but it's completely your call on this. Um, what I usually do, though, is I uncheck this show at startup. Um, that means for the rest of the time while we're logged in, if Maya crashes and we have to reopen it, it won't pop that thing up again. We don't have to keep answering that same question every time we open Maya. Okay. Everybody, everybody have something similar to this on, my, on, on their screen? You lost? All right. <laughs> Are you willing to get the screen sharing thing, or are you close enough to where you can just watch? Okay. Anybody else having any issues getting my open? Okay. I say okay a lot, don't I? Um, okay. Yeah. That, that's a little harder to work in casually. Um, so... Some of you have opened Maya before. Um, some of you, like this is your first time in here, or at least like one of the first times in here where we're actually going to do something in it. Uh, maybe you've opened it up, you saw this, and you quickly closed it down again. Um, today in class, our, our biggest um, plan, our biggest hurdle, the thing we need to accomplish, is just showing you what this program is and getting you navigating around in it. Okay. And then I'm going to give you an exercise that kind of just helps you practice navigating inside of Maya. Okay? Um, the first thing you're going to notice is that there are just a whole bunch of words and buttons that you have no idea what that's supposed to even be alluding to, right? Like, what do you suppose this thing here does? It looks like a chessboard kind of with a hole in it. I don't know. There's a snowflake with the number 000 in front of it. Like, it, like it, this can be very overwhelming the first time you open it to expect you to know what to do with this, right? Um, we're going to, uh, the first thing I need you to do is to not worry about it. Like, I don't really know what that snowflake button does either. Um, whenever you have a question like that, the easiest thing to do is to mouse over it. And a couple things will happen. One of them will pop up. It'll say freeze transformations, select an object. Okay, so that tells you how to do that. And it tells you what that button means. It means you're going to freeze your transformations. That, that didn't help at all, right? Like most of you still have no idea what that button means. Um, you also usually get a little bit more information down here in the bottom corner where it says freeze transformations. So the fact that you don't know what these icons stand for, that's okay. Like the, it's more about workflow. You're only going to use parts of Maya at any given point, right? And it is unreasonable. Like, you can, you can sit down and teach somebody how to use Microsoft Word in, like, an hour, right? You're not, Maya is not that kind of program, right? We're going to come out of this class after working on this for the entire semester. And if you feel like you understand 10% of Maya, that is a victory, right? Um, I, I really think I can get you out of here like feeling like you understand the basics of the entire program. But you don't have to know what every button does and know exactly how to use it to be a Maya user. Right? Some, some people are modelers, and they never animate a single thing in Maya. Maya is a full animation software. Um, all they ever do is go in there and do polygon modeling all day long, and if you ask them where the, uh, one of the animation tools are, they have no idea. Right? Like, I, don't, I do a little bit of modeling, but I don't do very much, like, fluid effects. Um, and so, like, when there's a, something like Bifrost is for fluid simulation, 
I, I don't know what some of those buttons do. I've not really done much in that. So that's okay. Don't feel like this is a software you have to understand inside and out to be productive in it. Um, let's look at sort of the way this is laid out. Like any other program you're ever going to open, you got all this file, windows, all this stuff across the top. The first button is always file. The last button is always help. And help is a good place to start. Um, if you click on help, you'll recognize that F1, the shortcut F1, will actually open up this giant like help section that is built into Maya. And sometimes that's the first place to go to look for, a, for an answer to your question. Just hit F1 and it'll open up your Maya help. Right? Um, now here's something I think is interesting about this is that entire menu, like you'll notice some of the, the words in the middle, like mesh and mesh tools and mesh display, all that stuff, right? Um, those change, um, not like on their own, but we can, we can change what is showing in our menu just by going to this little drop down menu right below here. And you'll currently see that we're, we're in the modeling um, mode, right? So if we click that little drop down button and go to animation, you'll see that the things that are on that menu change. And now we have a whole bunch of other stuff in here that we don't know what it does, right? Um, but this will help you kind of keep stuff organized to where you don't have to have like this enormous like five tiered menu. Um, ever, but almost everything that you'll ever need to use, you can find somewhere in the menu, okay? Now, right below the menu, like where we have this modeling tab, there's some pretty commonly used things in there. Like the little magnets are for snapping things. Let's say you have one object and you need to snap it to another object. That's what those magnets are used for. Um, you see these little clapboard things out here at the end, um, like a movie clapboard, like action. Clap. Um, that's for rendering, and we'll talk about those in a little while here. Probably tomorrow we'll get into to some of that. But directly below that, you'll see a whole bunch of tabs. So we got you know, these curves, poly menus. Each of these are a whole set of um, different icons, right? And these are the more commonly used icons for a specific, um, for a specific subset of the program, right? So right now we're in the poly modeling section, right? Um, poly stands for polygons, and we'll, we'll talk about that more later. Um, and so these are some of the more commonly used polygon modeling tools, okay? Um, we'll come back to that in just one second, but I want to just quickly run down the rest of the interface. This giant section in the middle with the grid, this is your um, workspace or your viewport as some people will call it. And then down here in the bottom is your animation tools. So this is your timeline. It's going to work very much like... Um, like, like any timeline you would have like on YouTube where you can scrub. So you can actually, if you want to click here, you can scrub and you can see that, you know, it updates the time. Um, nothing's going on yet, so it's not, no, nothing's animated yet, so it's not really going to matter. And then there's the play buttons down on the end. Now, down the side here, we'll talk, this, this is um, called the toolbar. Uh, this is where you have like your move tools and stuff like that, but there's another way that we'll do that more commonly. And then over here, this little side panel, this is usually where you're going to find all of the information about the objects that you have in your scene, right? So if you have a model of the car, you'll be able to select that model and come over here and this is where you'll find stuff about its texture, stuff about its, um, I, a whole bunch of different stuff, how it renders, all of those things. Okay. But the giant, most um, screen-consuming part of this interface is this giant gray area in the middle, right? Our viewport. Um, and right now it's just a grid and it's boring, so let's put something in it. So if you're in the poly modeling uh, menu here, um, click one of these first three or four buttons, like the first five buttons, right? I'm going to go ahead and click the box. Okay. And you'll see by clicking that box, now I have a box in the middle of my scene, okay? Now, what I just did was just created a polygon primitive, okay? Um, if you think about it, like, someday you're going to be trying to model a character's head. There's no create head button, right? There's no, like, create 
horse button, right? We have to start from very simple shapes and make those more complicated um, and you know, alter them, modify them until it becomes a horse, right? Um, so right now, we just have a box on our screen or maybe you made one of the little donut shapes or something like that, right? Um, this viewport is literally a camera view of a 3D world. This is a very simple video game engine, is what this is. Um, in fact, it works exactly like a game engine. It's, it, this is actually rendering with uh, your graphics card. Right? And just like any other game engine or any other real-time renderer, we can navigate around inside of this. Okay? And that's, that's the part that's going to be the most frustrating to you at first and what we're going to tackle first. So, moving around inside of the viewport, is relatively easy to remember the shortcut keys for. So the only shortcut key you need to remember on your keyboard is Alt. It's the one next to your space bar. Now hold down Alt, and with your mouse, um, click your left click button. So when we do that, if you click that and sort of drag it, if you hold it down and drag it, you're seeing that we're kind of orbiting around this. Right. Um, so feel free to like sort of tumble around this object. Um, that's what this is called. It's called tumbling. Right. Our op we're looking at a box, and we are sort of orbiting around it, or, or sort of rotating our camera around it. So again, you need to think of this as as if we're looking at this scene with a camera, because all of the um, all of the terminology comes from camera terms, right? So you're tumbling around this. Tumbling is a camera term. That's what, that's something you would use on a film set is you sort of orbit around it, you're tumbling. Um, so go ahead and continue to hold Alt and right click and drag. So you get to see that what we're doing now is we're pushing in and out. Now, we, we have a tendency to call this zooming, like zoom in on your object so I can see it more. Um, I want to make a slight distinction, distinction that this isn't zooming, because zooming is the camera stays in the same place and you adjust the lens to make it look like that object is closer. What we are doing right now is literally moving our camera closer to the object, okay? And that is called dollying. We're dollying in and out. Okay. Um, you can still call it zooming. I'm not gonna like slap your hand with a ruler or something for that, um, because that's really I, I, I have a tendency to say push in, um, like you know move your camera closer in. Um, but that's what we're doing. So we have those two keys. If you hold Alt and left click, we can tumble around it. Alt and right click, we can push in. Right. So some of you may be aware that. Your mouse actually has three buttons, right? You have the right click, the left click, and then you have that little scroll wheel. Now, if you scroll that scroll wheel, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to dolly in and out, right? I don't even have to hold Alt, and I can scroll that scroll wheel, and it'll push in and out, right? Um, but that's not really the button I'm talking about, because if you push down on your scroll wheel, you'll feel it click a little bit. Um, that's not a feature most people use in, like, browsing the Internet. Um, but if we hold Alt and push down on that scroll wheel until it clicks, you'll see that what I can do now is pan. I can move my camera from side to side. Okay? These three options, basically your three mouse buttons while holding down Alt, is how you're going to do all of your navigation inside of Maya. So, unfortunately, this is the part that takes some getting used to. Um, it's like, just getting around inside of a 3D scene can be very frustrating, right? Because what you're going to end up doing is, like, let's say you're, you're messing around over here, and, oops, sorry, um, and suddenly you find yourself over here, and you start tumbling, and you're like, wait, that thing's not in front of me anymore. How do I get back? Ah, and then you're like, so the first time I started using Maya, like, about a week into it, I realized I was getting neck cramps right up here, right? And, and it was because I was 
doing it like this because I was so scared I was going to hit the wrong buttons and, and navigate like incorrectly and suddenly my object would be on my screen and I would never see it again. Um, you kind of have to practice this. You have to get comfortable moving around. And that's one of the things the exercise is going to do today is give you some challenges. But let's try one right now. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go ahead and grab that box, right? And right now I'm like way over here. I want to be over there where I was tumbling around that box again. So I'm just going to hit the F key. Now F is going to focus me in on the object I have selected. And by doing that, now I'm able to very quickly sort of look at just that box. Now, I'm going to go ahead and delete that box. I, you can keep yours if you want to, but I just want to show you um, sort of like a little test is, uh, no, let's, let's go ahead and, let's go ahead and leave the box, sorry. Um, so one of the things you could try to do is give yourself challenges, right? Um, like, let's say I'm currently looking at the box right here. Right? I want to um, be looking at the box from below. Um, you know, how do I get to that? Right? And so I can go to here, right? Um, if I had a couple of different boxes sort of scattered here, you could literally do like the, the car driving tests, right? Like put all those boxes and say, I'm going to try to navigate my, hand, my camera through these objects, right? We could make one of those little donuts and say, I'm going to try to put my camera through that hole and come out the other side, right? Um, because that's what you're going to see as you're working. You're going to be modeling something. You're going to be modeling a remote control, and you're going to be like, I don't want to see it from this side. I want to see it from way over here and close to the three button, right? And, and you have to be able to get there pretty quickly, right? Um, and so the more practice you do in this, the more you try to tumble around, try to get to awkward places um, inside of the, the viewport, the more comfortable you're going to get in there. To be honest, the first time I taught this class, the hardest part for me was remembering what those buttons were because I do it automatically now. Like I don't even look at my mouse, my keyboard. I just sit down and start. It's like driving your car. Like if, you, if you've been driving for a while, you just sit down, you put it in gear. You're not like... Cannon 2, uh, I, like you just get in it and you start driving. Things become natural to you. It's like walking you around. And so that's where we need to get you is where you're not um, uncomfortable just moving around inside of this viewport. Okay? So I've shown you now how to move our camera around objects, um, but we can actually change these objects too, right? So, um, if you haven't right now, I want you to go ahead and grab whichever object you created. The, there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can actually just click on it. Like if you just click right there, it should select it. Um, you can also, if you notice, if you click drag, your mouse makes this little marquee. And anything that is within that marquee will get selected. So if you just click drag, like that's how I usually select stuff, is I just drag over it. Um, so when that's selected, um, you'll notice that this little window over here on the side <coughs> changed, right? When it wasn't selected, there, that was empty. And when it is selected, it's got stuff in it. And that's because those are attributes, those are features or information about my box, okay, about this box I've created. Okay. Um, what you'll notice Translate X, translate Y, translate Z, rotate X, Y, Z, scale X, Y, Z, and visibility. All models, all objects you create in Maya will have at least those options. Okay? Um, and this is a concept that um, we need to kind of go back a little bit and talk about. So how many of you have remember the phrase, the Cartesian coordinate system. Probably all heard it in high school. Or other stuff. So what is the Cartesian coordinate system? It's the plane. It's like the, the, the Descartes plane where plot points and yeah. and y-axis. So any, any, um, any chart that you look at, any um, uh, graph that you would look at is usually on a Cartesian coordinate system. But let's just talk about this um, sort of theoretically for a minute, right? 
um, the Cartesian coordinate system is a way to be able to pass information to somebody else about a location of a point, right? So let's let's do this as an example. Um, Radina works in the main office downstairs, right? You, you probably got your parking pass from her, right? Um, and she has scissors, but I have no scissors, right? Um, up here with me now. Let's say I had a piece of string, right? And I needed that piece of string to be exactly three feet long, right? Um, the Cartesian coordinate system was invented so we could pass that information to Radina, right? All I have to do is, like, I can say, um, sorry, I, I'm forgetting names. What, what's your name again? Keon. I can say, Keon, um, could you take this string down to Radina and have her cut it three feet long, right? You have all the information necessary to bring back a piece of string that is the exact right length, right? We know where the origin point of that string is. It's the end of the string, right? And so she could take that piece of string and go one, two, three, measure it out, and cut it in the exact right place, right? Um, that is one dimension, right? One number. Um, because we only need that one number to cut a perfectly straight line, right? So that's, that's kind of how that works um, for something that is just straight, like a, a single direction, right? Um, if you ask somebody, hey, how, I know this is in theory a straight direction. If you're driving down a road in a straight direction, right, and you say, hey, how far to the next McDonald's, right, um, they'll be like, that's two miles. Well, you know from the point you are right now, you have to drive in a straight line for two miles to get to that McDonald's. And then you go, well, why am I going to McDonald's? I should look for a Wendy's. Anyway, um, <laughs> ah, McDonald's is good. Um, so that's one axis. That's one dimension, right? So two dimensions is a flat plane. Right? So let's take this image as an example here, right? This, this screen that we have. Um, or I guess better yet, because I don't want to draw on this screen, we could use that whiteboard as an example back there, right? Um, any any white, any like flat surface we can um, use as a two-dimensional example. Now it really does have depth, but right now we're just talking about the, the two-dimensional shape, right? Even a piece of paper, you could all pull out a piece of paper right now, and I would say, okay, from the bottom right-hand corner, go over two inches, and go up five inches, and you could draw an X right there in the same spot. Everybody in this classroom could draw an X just with those two numbers, at, uh, two and five, or is it two and five? <laughs> um, and we could all draw an X in the same exact spot on the same exact piece of paper. We could all draw the same dot on that same whiteboard back there just with two numbers. All we need is an origin point and two values, right? Um, when you're keeping track of these numbers, um, we would give them a letter name, right? So when you're keeping track of one dimension, it's an X, right? So the value of X is 7, right? When you're keeping, a, keeping track of two of them, it's X and Y. So now we can step into the third dimension, the one we actually really live in, right? And I can define anything in this room, I can define its location with three numbers and an origin point, right? Um, I could pick the, the bottle cap on my water bottle, right? Um, all I have to do is find my origin point, say the bottom corner of that room, or the bottom corner of this, this corner over here on the ground, right? Um, come over 15 feet, forward 3 feet, up 2 feet. That's where that lid on this water bottle is, right? That's true with all 3D space. Okay? If you have an origin point and three numbers, then you can find any point in this entire room. I know that was a, I know you're probably familiar with all of this. That's the Cartesian coordinate system. And if we're going to work inside of a 3D program, everything revolves around that. Okay? So, we can, our box is currently at 0, 0, 0. That is our origin. And we know that because Translate x is 0, translate y is 0, translate z is 0, right? Now, if I type in 6 on translate x, it's going to move my object over 6 units on the grid, right? Um, if I type in 3 on my y, it's going to move it up 3. I typed in, let's say, 7 here. It's going to move it forward 7. This location of that box now 
is x6, y3, z7, right? And anybody in this room can create a box that's in that same exact location with those three numbers. So this is how um, Maya, Maya works. You don't have to type in those numbers to get objects wherever you want it to go, though, right? We can manually move them. We just need those numbers to keep track of it for other reasons. So when it comes time to move this stuff, we have a series of shortcut keys. So if you look underneath your number keys, the first or the top row of letters, Q, W, E, and R, right? Q is select. That's where you're usually at by default, okay? And if you look up here in the top corner, this little arrow is surrounded with blue, right? That's the select button. So if you don't like using shortcut keys, you can pick it from there. Trust me, this QWER thing is way faster in the long run. So this means I can select any objects, but I can click on them. I can't really move it, right? W is the move tool. And so when I hit W, you'll see that now I have this little set of arrows that are on top of my box, right? So let's look at how this move tool works. If I grab from the center, like there's a little yellow box there, if I grab it and move it, I'm moving it all over the place, right, and all the different axes, but you'll recognize that I'm moving it kind of parallel to my screen. So if I wanted to try to move it closer to me, I can't really figure out how to do that, right, because, like, what is closer to me? Like, it's, it's a different axis, right? Um, however, I can grab these axes individually. I can move it in X, I can move it in Y, I can move it in Z, and now it's definitely closer to me, right? So, you can move it in any axis by itself, or if you look here, there's these little planes. Right? I tumble around it here. You'll see that there's kind of like a, a blue plane here. And the blue plane is going to move it in both the Y and the X at the same time. And then vice versa, not vice versa, so the same with these other axes. Okay? So there's a whole bunch of different ways to move this object around, wiggle it all over your screen, put it wherever you need it to. Okay. So this is the move tool, and you'll see as I'm doing that, those numbers are changing, because now it's in a new spot. Now it's in negative 9.3, 6.3, and 5.7, right? Um, all right, so that's moving it. Um, so if W is move, what do you think E is? Rotate. So let's hit E. Now, again, like the move tool, if I just kind of grab out here in open space, I can rotate it in all sorts of different axes, and you'll see I'm getting all of this rotation value here, right? Um, I want to undo that really quick and just show you something. Um, if I start rotating this in X, right, if I grab the X axis, which is the red axis, um, then it's just going to rotate it in that axis alone, right? I need you to recognize that that number in rotate X is in degrees, right? So I moved it one unit, and it moved it a whole grid unit over. But if I move it one de degree, you barely see the movement at all, right? How many degrees does it take to turn this thing all the way around? 360. So rotation is on a 360-degree um, scale, right? Recognize that when I'm rotating in X, I'm rotating around the X axis. Think of X as the axle for this thing, right? And when I'm rotating in X, I'm rotating around that axis. Okay? Um, and of course, scale is going to work very similar. So that's R for scale. And I can grab this yellow box in the middle, make the whole thing bigger or I can scale it in just one direction. I can start making this thing a completely different shape. Okay. So that box I started off with is now a plank. Okay. Let's talk just a minute about this XYZ thing again. So um, XYZ are the three axes that we're going to move things around here and rotate them, scale them. It's the only three axes that actually exist in the real world, right? Um, the argument for a fourth dimension being time, cool, whatever, that's outside of the scope of this class. Um, 
But figuring out which one is x, which one's y, and which one is z is sometimes a little like hard for people to wrap their head around. So um, I'm going to give you a phrase that will help you remember this. Um, if you have to, um, when you're talking about color, if you've had visualization, you've probably heard this. Right? When you're talking about color inside of the computer, you're going to use two phrases. You're going to either use CMYK, which is the colors that you have in your printer, you know, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. K is black. Um, or you're going to use RGB, and RGB is most of the color schemes that we see on here, right? And you'll notice that all of the axes are colored R, G, and B, red, green, and blue, right? So RGB, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, R, G, B. And so you can keep them in order in that way. Um, red is going to be X, um, Y is going to be green, and blue is going to be Z. I said that all over the place, but you know what I'm saying. Um, so this is something that you'll have to kind of remember over time. OK. Um, I think that that's a pretty good spot. I need to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. OK. So anybody have any questions about any of this? Are you able to navigate around all right, move stuff around all right? Yes. Um, there is a way to change uh, key bindings. Um, I probably wouldn't do it for those main keys, but if there's something specific you're wanting to add to it. Um, all of that's going to be under Windows Settings and Preferences, and it's this hotkey editor. So that is something you can do. You're going to run into things that um, are very, uh, like something you use a lot, but maybe not everybody else does. Um, I usually create a shortcut key to open my graph editor for animation. Um, so there's a lot of different things that you may need to create a shortcut key for, um, and yeah, we can we can do that. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of other things um, inside of Maya that's that's useful. So with your mouth, mouth with your mouse just floating over the viewport here, I want you to tap the spacebar. Okay. Now I just multiplied my uh, by four here. We got so we have four different windows here, and these are all labeled. Okay, so this is the one we were looking at before, perspective, right? And at any point that you want that one back as like a full screen window, just mouse over it. You don't have to click anything. Your mouse just has to be over that one. Tap the space bar again. Okay, and then the same with any of these others. So. I'm going to go ahead and leave these four open so we can kind of look at this. Um, we can navigate around in these just like the perspective window. The only difference is these other three are what we call orthographic windows. Um, orthographic means there is no foreshortening in these. Right? So I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm looking at a row of heads you know, moving backward to the back of the room, and your head is this big. But the people in the back, your head's just this big, right? And we know because we live in the world that that doesn't mean that the people in the back actually just have really tiny heads, right? That's, that's how things work. The further away they are from us in the real world, the smaller they look, right? Um, that's called perspective. That's really, again, that's how we see everything and everything aesthetically that we create, we will create with perspective. But it's really, really frustrating when you're trying to create something that is a specific size in a world that has depth, right? So an orthographic view means that no matter how far away it gets, it's always going to be the same size, right? So let's, let's look at this plank from above, right? So this is the top view of this plank. This is the front view. And this is the side view, right? And if I were to grab this and move it further away, move it downward so it's getting further away from the top view, you'll see that it doesn't change. Right? Once it goes through the grid, it gets that grid overlay on it. But I could move this thing literally miles away, and it's always going to be the same size. This is how blueprints are drawn. This is how anything technical is illustrated so you can have precise measurements for things. Right? 
and this kind of evolves out of the um, the CAD world. Has anybody ever used an AutoCAD program of any kind? Yeah, so um, so you're seeing that in CAD and drafting, um, orthographic views come from that, and it allows you to be precise um, in a front, right, and side view, and it, and it gives you a good profile. So like, if you're wanting to draw somebody's face, you can you know draw it, draw them from the profile view, and, and make sure you're getting that accurate in the side view. Right? Um, so a lot of people like to keep all four of these open when they're modeling stuff. Um, some people never go into any of these orthographic views at all. Um, the big thing to recognize here is this means I can customize my UI. Though. The layout, the way these windows are set up, is completely customizable. And so if I go to panels, layouts, you'll see that there's a whole bunch of presets in here. I can have um, two planes stacked. So I could have, or two panes stacked. So I can have my perspective on the top and my top view above that, right? And, um, and this may be helpful in how I'm creating stuff, right? It doesn't just have to be viewports, though. Um, let's do something like uh, three panes split top, right? Maybe what I can do here is under panels, I can change this to my uh, graph editor which we'll explain what that is later. And this can be my, um, under panels, I'll make this my outliner, right? I didn't really need two outliners, but whatever. Um, there we go. And so now I have this set up to where I have all of this extra information. I can customize my, my UI however I want. Um, there's also this button up here in the top that will allow you to sort of create these preset UIs. Um, so, like, if you're going to be doing animation, you click on the animation button, and it kind of loads it for you the way um, it thinks you, you might want it. Um, okay. Last thing I'm going to show you, um, all of this stuff, all of the menu, all of the UI, all that stuff up at the top, um, that's not the only way you have to use it. Like some people like to organize their Maya workflow and a lot of different things, and they just don't like going to menus, right? So remember when we were tapping the space bar earlier? Right now I want you to tap the space bar, but I want you to hold it down. Okay. So you get this thing that pops up. Let me do this. This is called a marking menu. And the reason for this is because some people like to quickly gesture, just, yeah, gesture when they're making um, decisions, right? So let's say I want to keep this full screen view, but I want to bounce around between my front and my perspective. If I hold down the space bar and click on the word Maya, I get this radial map around it, right? And I can choose my right view. Now I'm in my right view, and now I can choose my front view. Now I'm in my front view, and now I can go back to my perspective view, right? And some people would rather do that than go up to the menu and look for stuff. The other thing you'll notice, and this, this, this marking menu appears wherever your mouse is, right? So if my mouse is over here, hit the space bar, it pops up there. Over here, space bar pops up there. The things you'll notice is some of these other menus, all this other stuff that's in there, that's all of the things that go across the top menu up there. If you look at the very top, file, edit, create, select, modify, display, all of those are the words that are across the top of our menu. Down here below, Mesh, Edit Mesh, Mesh Tools, that's some of the menu items from the modeling preset. Um, key, Playback, Visualize, Deform, that's from the animation preset, right? So there's a lot of different um, things that we can get to just by holding down the space bar. Some people like working this way, right? Um, and so pretty much anything up here, if I wanted to, to go in here and create a new object, I could go there, create polygon primitive sphere and now I have a sphere right and I can move this around and I and I can do that with very minimal mouse movement um, every person in this room is going to discover the way they prefer to work I'm not going to force you to do any specific method of working some people love using the marking menus some people don't some people will never use them I'm one that uses them very minimally. Like I, I use them sometimes, but not for a lot of stuff. I'm fine going to the menu. 
I have other people, uh, other friends who never use them at all. They all only use the marking menus. Um, and then some people will just tie a shortcut key to everything that they need to use, right? everything that they want to ever do. Um, and all of those are fine. Like this is this is your program um, to to use it to create things. And if you are making great art, holding your pencil like in your fist, like who in the world is whose business is it to tell you to do it differently, right? What I will say is that sometimes I can make suggestions that help make stuff more efficient. Okay, so when I mention shortcut keys, that's because I think shortcut keys are really quick ways of toggling between those things. You don't have to move your mouse and then go back and get it in that position. But you may hate shortcut keys um, and you want to click on stuff. So that's what a lot of the beginning of this class is, is you sort of learning how to um, create things the way you want to create them. Okay, questions, comments? All right. Oh, I'm pretty talkative. So let's go ahead and start exercise one. Um, exercise one is something I'm going to assign you. Um, you can take it home. You can work on it today for the rest of class. Um, but it will be due next class period. Okay? So that means you'll probably have to put a little bit of time into it between now and, no, you'll have to put a little bit of time in it between now and Wednesday. Right? When you come in on Wednesday, um, we'll all have pretty much the same thing, and we can keep building from there. Okay, so let's look at project one. I gotta upload it over to the, the server really quick. Well, let's check this out. Um, give me one second. Okay, so up in that ETSU E3 um, folder, POA, that's our class, and then files, you're going to see a folder that says bridge. Okay, um, how many of you are not, um, don't use Windows a lot? Like you're either use a tablet or use a Mac or something like that. All right, so if, if I say something that um, is confusing about what I mean, um, just slow me down. That's cool. I, I, I recognized recently that that was something I didn't see coming. Like the the amount of people who use exclusively a tablet, I is growing, and that means like some sometimes like me saying pop in the USB drive and copy this folder over just doesn't make sense, right? So that's fine. Um, but this folder, this bridge folder, is something you need. You need everything in this folder. So if you have, hopefully you brought a jump drive or some form of hard drive with you today. Um, go ahead and plug that in. Um, if you didn't, that's all right. We can um, put that somewhere locally, or we can upload this like to Google Drive or something like that. But to complete this project, you're going to need this entire folder somewhere on your computer. Right? Anybody forget to bring a jump drive and need a place to put it? Okay. So if you didn't bring one, um, how you can where you can put it is in your documents folder right here. Um, you can just plop it in there somewhere, um, or you can put it on your D drive, which is the local drive for your computer. That means if you move to another computer, it's not going to be there. If it's in your documents folder, it should be, but I can't make any promises. What I would say is put it in your documents folder, and then we can zip up that folder and email it to yourself when you're done working today, and that way you have a, a backup of it. Um, so what I'm going to do is go back. I'm going to select this folder, right click, copy, and then I'm going to go ahead and put mine in my documents folder. Um, if you have your jump drive with it, with you, put it somewhere on your jump drive. Um, I'm just going to hit paste. Okay. So it's copying a whole bunch of stuff down. There's some extra files in there. There's some textures. Um, Okay, so there it is, bridge. 
Now, I'm currently inside of that bridge folder, and we get this entire folder structure in here. Okay? That bridge folder is what we call a Maya project. Now, that's not the casual term of projects. Like, I'm going to build some cabinets today. That's my project. No. A project is a, an actual thing. It's, it's a, uh, a structure that Maya is going to follow in order to know where everything is. Like, by far, by far, like, like, it's light years ahead. The question I have to, uh, the, the problem that people have the most, the question I have to troubleshoot the most, is stuff like, why aren't my textures showing up? Where is my file? Why can't my, where did Maya put my renders? All of those are because people refuse to pay attention to the fact that this is a project structure. Okay? You can't put anything ever, ever related to this project anywhere else except inside of this bridge folder. If you save a texture to your desktop and then you bring it here, your desktop is not here. Right? If you're working on this at home and you save it in your, like, my favorite bunny pictures folder, whatever, your favorite bunny pictures didn't come with you. You have to keep it all underneath this bridge folder or Maya will just, like, it'll just crumble. Like, sometimes it literally just won't open. Um, you'll lose all of your textures. You'll render to some computer and then shut down and it'll erase all of your renders and you'll lose eight hours worth of work. Like, this is by far the most frequently asked question. I would almost petition to change the name of this class to set your project. Um, so let's talk about how we do that, okay? If we go to Maya um, and go File, Open Scene. I'm sure this isn't real. Uh, that doesn't look real. Um, file, Open Scene. Um, it's going to take us to this random folder here. It's uh, C, Users, Marlow G, Documents, Maya, Project, Default, Scenes, right? Um, that is a project. It's just not our bridge project. Right? We need to be able to open the bridge project file. So to do that, we have to set our project. We have to tell Maya, now we're working on this bridge project, so you need to associate everything with that folder. So if we go to this set project button right here, I can now go to my documents, or for you, you may have put it on your jump drive, wherever you save that bridge folder, and click on bridge, and hit set. And you'll see now it goes to that bridge folder. And under that scenes folder, what is all this stuff? Oh, people have been saving stuff up there again, haven't they? Um, oh, goodness. <laughs> I can't believe it. Oh... Uh, so the one we're looking for is Bridge Deconstructed. Oh man, I copied the wrong one in there. Th this is fine, but I basically gave you a whole bunch of other files that other people have been saving over because they set their project in the wrong spot. Um, the one we're looking for is Bridge Deconstructed. You can actually delete all of those others. Yeah, so if we hit open, don't save, Maya's going to open this scene. Okay, now, this doesn't really look like a bridge. Let's go into that Maya folder again, in this bridge folder, right? And I want to show you some stuff. So there's, the scenes is where all of our Maya files are stored, right? Images, there's a whole bunch of pictures in here, right? Um, and if we click on it, we'll see like some movies, we've got a whole bunch of stuff. But you see this bridge. This is what you need to create. Um, if we actually go out of, uh, to the bottom of images, no. Um, examples, here we go. You'll see some, sure, that'll work. You'll see some other examples of what the bridge should look like, right? But what you currently have is, they, is the bridge deconstructed, okay? Um, so using the move tools, using the navigate tools, you're going to take all of these pieces and put it back together until it looks like this. So you can move stuff around. You'll see some stuff like these little, these little pieces here. 
they're all like connected together. So some of this stuff may mean that ooh, may mean that you want to rotate it in a specific axis. You'll notice rotate Z is set to 90. If I set that to zero, what does that do? It stands it up. Maybe that's what I might need to do. So, um, so we're going to take all of these pieces as if it was just a you know pack of Legos you just bought, and we're going to put it back together into that bridge. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you some leeway here. Um, it, it, a lot of people get really um, specific on this, and they're like, but that's off a fraction of an inch. Like, it just has to look like a bridge. I'm not going to be like, you're off like three microns, um, you fail. Like, this is just put, to, put these pieces together into a bridge, right? Um, try to make it look good. Try to make it look nice. Um, I'll be honest with you, later, you actually have the option to completely redo all these pieces of this bridge if you would like. You can, you can make changes to this. We're going to add textures to this. All of that stuff. Um, but all you have to do is put this together based off of those images that we have in that folder um, into your own version of bridge. Now, because I was sloppy and, and copied that over without looking into the folder and seeing that um, some other people's files were in there, there's a chance that what I just ha had you download has a finished version of this in there, right? It does. I'm pretty sure it's called Bridge Constructed. Um, so don't use that one. <laughs> so, um, what you're going to turn in um, is, is just the Maya file of you putting this together. Having said this, I'm doing this on the honor system. Like, I trust you. Um, and you're not slipping one by me by just opening up the constructed one and turning that in instead. You're really just kind of screwing yourself out of the practice you need to get comfortable in Maya. So um, if you think that's, if you want to use that, that's fine. I guarantee you the next, pro or the next exercise gets even harder, so you're not going to get much out of it. So this is really an exercise. This is like doing bench presses or like running on the treadmill or whatever. This is to help you get in practice um, so this becomes easier for you later, right? Um, so piece this together. You have the rest of class to hang out here. I think we have class until 445. Is that when we run out of time? So um, work on it as long as you need to. I'll be here until um, 445 or the last person leaves first. Um, the rest of class is yours, though. So when I say that, what I mean is, I understand that I just droned on for an hour and some, and some of you are starving to death, and you're like, oh, i got to run to Wendy's and get some food before my next class. Or some of you are like, um, I'm falling asleep because it's dark in here. Whatever. I understand that. The rest of the class is yours, which means whatever decision you make from here is fine and will not receive any judgment from me. Um, if you're like, I'm leaving, bye, that's great. If you're like, I'm going to stay here and work and ask you lots of questions, that's great. Literally, the rest of the class is yours to decide to do with as you want, wish. But I'll be here if you have any questions and you want to use the rest of the time for work time. Um, this brings up an, an, an interesting uh, or an important thing to note. Right? So I'm going to make two kind of quick announcements um, before I really sort of wrap things up. One is you are going to run into issues outside of class, um, projects, or problems with your project, whatever. Um, when I am not here, right? When I can't just like peek in the door and answer your question. Um, there's a couple of things you can do to troubleshoot that. One of them is posting to band. I saw a few people have posted some stuff that's cool. Like just start sharing some stuff. What's, what's your favorite animation? Like start linking that stuff up there. Um, so asking those questions, somebody else in this class may have already been fighting with that and they can give you a quick answer. Or if I'm just sitting there and I see a pop-up on my phone, I may be able to answer it. Um, but I'm an old man and I go to sleep early. So sometimes you're having these questions at 3 o'clock in the morning and somebody can answer that question for you. The other thing is you may have noticed on the desktop, I believe it's showing it on the desktop, um, freshman tutoring. So Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday in this room from about 8 to 10 p.m. And Saturday from 1 to 4 in this room. Okay? The person who is going to be the tutor will be wearing like a, like one of those like construction vests so you know who they are um, so you're not just asking random pe people are you a tutor are you a tutor 
they are people who have gone through this class before and know all of these answers, right? They, they know how to help you with this. Please utilize that. Like, this is something that um, is extremely helpful. These are, not only is that a, um, a quick way for you to figure out problems instead of having to wait for two or three days to, to get it, sometimes um, they can also offer you other tidbits, other perspectives on this that I am not offering you. Like, I, I understand stuff in certain ways and try to communicate it in certain ways. Sometimes somebody else looks at it from a different angle and, and them explaining that to you in that angle will be helpful. And it's also just a good way to make friends, like meet new people who can help you, right? Who can be helpful. Because someday you're going to be helping other people as well. Um, so that is something that I would encourage you to do. Um, take advantage of that, especially if you feel like you're struggling with this. There's a lot of hours that they will be here. Um, pretty much, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at night after you're done eating dinner or whatever, come on over here and, and just ask them some questions. Um, and Saturday, if you're a Saturday worker, that's another good time. I think that's Brianna will be here then. Um, David is usually the one who's here during the week. They are both excellent at this stuff. Um, so the other thing I'll say is I posted something on Band a couple of hours ago about Edge, the Edge Club. Do you guys know what that is? Anybody know what that is? All right. So in case you're unfamiliar with it, the Edge Club is a, um, a digital media um, student group. It's basically the, uh, the you know, animation, game design, visualization, visual effects enthusiasts, right? And so um, they organize like games, they organize guest speakers. This semester, we're in the process of getting a couple of people to, uh, to do Skype chats with us. Uh, one of them is David Edwards. He was a former student of mine. He's currently working at Blizzard um, on World of Warcraft as an animator. Um, and another former student, uh, Chase Cooper, um, who worked on um, the most recent Star Wars movie, which I'm The Last Jedi. Um, he's a technical creature artist, which he's basically rigging creatures and setting up creatures for, um, for rigging. He also did Rango, or worked on Rango. Um, so he works at ILM now, and literally Edge is going to organize a, a Skype chat with him where you can ask them questions, um, chat with them one-on-one, -on -one, make connections with them. Um, they also, I think to, uh, the first meeting is coming up here in a few days, um, and they're going to do, uh, I think, a, a game, uh, play a game that is uh, designed by Marty Henley. He's one of the other principal's teachers. Um, so you may, anybody have Marty as a, in a class? Yeah. So he usually teaches principles of game design um, and teach, uh, principles of animation. But since you're in principles of animation now, you probably have him in game design. Um, so he is, him and another guy are designing a board game. And um, they are trying to get funding for that. And so it would be a gameplay test of that if you want to check it out. It's actually a really cool game. Um, so there's flyers hanging up all over the building. Edge is a great place to sort of make some connections, make some friends, you know, meet people, rub elbows, and just talk about stuff you're excited about. You're, you're in this major, I'm assuming, because you're excited about this stuff. So are they. Um, and like, you know, it can be fun. So please go check that out. Um, anybody have any questions about anything in the whole entire universe? How to specifically save your project from the download? Oh, OK. So that file we went and opened. Um, good, good question. Um, that, when we went to uh, file uh, open scene, um, all we have to do now is go file save scene as. If you hit save scene, it will save it over bridge deconstructed. I usually do file save scene as, and we can type in like <coughs> final or something like that. Whatever, wh however it is you want to name it, right? Um, I will also say that um, something that's a handy tool, and this is like a quick, we'll call it like a quick save, um, but it allows you to save an iteration of your file. So one of the biggest problems is people saving over their file over and over again, and then you delete something and you save over it and you're like, crap, I'm never getting that back now, right? Um, these files are not huge. Um, so if you go file, increment, and save, you'll see what it, up here is the name of the file, bridge deconstructed, you can see it along the top. So if I go File, Increment, and Save, you'll see what it does is it puts a .001 on there. And if I made a change of some sort and then go File, Increment, and Save again, it does .002. 
Um, that's a way that I like to work because then you can have hundreds and hundreds of files and if anything ever goes haywire, you can go back through there and find the last version of it that was working and you don't lose as much work. Um, again, disk space is pretty cheap um, and I literally for one project had I think 1,500 save files, um, but who cares? So, uh, any other questions, comments on anything? Yes. Kind of need help setting the project. Okay. Um, some other people may too. So let me show you guys that one more time, or you all that one more time. Um, so there's a couple of different ways we can do that. If we go file open scene, there's set project here, or we can go to file set project and then all we have to do is point to the folder the topmost folder so for ours it'll be bridge and we hit that and hit set so now maya associates this this version or it, maya associates that with your project everything it's going to go looking for is in that folder so now when you go to open a file file open scene it's going to automatically take you to the scenes folder of your bridge project okay if for some reason it doesn't you can also hit this workspace root button there, and it'll take you to your workspace, and you can you can get in there and open up bridge deconstructed. There we go. Would that help? Mm -hmm. um, are there questions, comments? Yes. Is there, I see there's like an align tool, but I was wondering. Yeah. So <laughs> um, I can I can show you this if this is something you're you're curious about. Um, there's there's two or three different things. There's align tools, and then there's snap tools. Um, the two that are going to be most commonly used, although I don't necessarily know if it will work for this. It could, but it'd almost be harder than to manually place it. Um, so let me show you how those work. Um, so if I select this object and hit W, right? Um, this little green arrow, this is its pivot point, the object's pivot point. And so Maya may think of this object in this giant rectangle, but really its location is the center of that pivot point, right? Um, and so I can snap that to points as well. So like if I wanted to snap this to the center of my grid, I could use these little magnet tools up here. So this one is the grid snap or snap to view plane. Um, this is snap to projected center. I don't really know what that even means. Um, this is snap to points. Uh, this is snap to a curve. And this is snap to grid, right? So I, actually, let's go ahead and do snap to grid. That probably will work better. When I click that and turn that on, now when I move this, you'll see that it, it snaps to whole grid points. And so I can move that over until it lines up with the grid, right? Now, I could do the same thing here, and instead of snapping to grid, I could say snap to point. And what that's going to do is snap it to, like, the end of something. Um, but I'm not sure that's as helpful. But we could do, like, again, the snap to grid, get it pretty close. Um, there we go. And then when we take this out here, yeah, that actually works pretty good. Good, good catch. Um, there is another thing that's kind of neat, which is the align tool, and that's under modify. I'm sorry, it's not align. This is match transformations. And so if I were to grab this object, I could go to, oh, grab this object, grab that object. So you hold shift to grab multiple objects at once, or you could drag. So if I could click that, hold shift, I can grab another one. And so I can go to modify, match transformations, match translations, and you'll see that it moves it to the location of the other one. So that's the mainly main used um, tools, but um, hopefully that's helpful. Any other questions, comments? Yes. Is it possible to reset my preferences? I accidentally touched the space bar when I was trying to scroll and it completely screwed me. Yeah, I, I, I can help you do that. Uh, um, so it sounds like most of the questions are like little one-on-one -on -one questions. If you have any, you're welcome to hang around for the rest of the class and continue to work. I can help you. Um, but otherwise, class is yours. Do what you want. Um, and I'll see you next class period. I'm also going to go ahead and stop this video, and I will upload it to YouTube here. Um, I'll try to do it by the end of the class.